Friends, may I speak in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week we spoke about um, the journey that we are on throughout the duration of Lent, the pilgrimage, one might say, of Lent, which begins not in a place but with an awareness. That is, an awareness that there is a gap between the life that we dream of, certainly the life that God dreams for us and for the world, and the life we live, perhaps individually, but certainly collectively as a community, a society, and the world. We can all look about us. Perhaps it's the, the chaos that might surround us, the discord that might be part of our family and our society, and certainly part of our society. And we can see immediately the gap between God's dream and our world. And so the pilgrimage of Lent begins in that awareness with the dream that, and perhaps even the confidence that we can approach, that we can more closely approach the dream of God for the world. And so we commit ourselves to make that pilgrimage in order that through prayer, through presence and passion, and promise and praise, we might come to more easily align our lives with the dream of God for us. And so today and over the coming weeks, Mother Maureen and I will speak about tools, aids that will help us make that pilgrimage. And in so making that pilgrimage, perhaps close that gap that exists within our individual lives. And if we are able to close that gap that exists within our personal lives and within our community here, we may be confident that we are closing the gap between the dream of God for the world and the life of the world itself. So today I want to talk about this thing called prayer. Now for some of you, your mind may already be wandering. Because that's what happens a lot of times when some of us stop to pray. Immediately we're flooded with our list of things to do. All of the obligations that weigh upon us. And so if your mind has already gone there because I've said that four-letter word, don't worry. It's common. We'll get there. Some of you also may have said, oh my God, Drew, what are you doing? One more thing for my day. It's already crunched. It's already booked from 6 a.m. when I awake to 10 p.m. when I go to sleep. And you want to add one more thing to my list or to my calendar? Please, Lord, spare me. And so if you're already overwhelmed by the fact that I've said the word pray or prayer, be patient. Perhaps this conversation will be life-giving as opposed to draining again. For you see, prayer is not just a thing that we do. It is a thing that we do. We'll talk about that. But I want us to hold that thing to the side for a moment. For at its core, prayer is about the life that we live. It is about a life in which that gap between God's dream and our reality shrinks. To put it more concretely, prayer is a life, is the way of living in response to God. Prayer is the way of our life. And so when we see a, a vast gap between our life and God's dream, we might acknowledge that 
our life is less prayerful, that it is less aligned with the way that God dreams our lives to be. And in those wonderful moments when we feel our life is so enmeshed, so intertwined with the story of God, perhaps because we have welcomed life into our hearts, or perhaps because we have reached out and united our life with another in love and in grace and in mercy, in those times where our life seems to be so infused with the goodness of God. We are immersed in prayer whether a word of prayer has entered our mind or not. For at its core, prayer is about the life we live in response to God. And so in some ways, prayer is nothing more than your life, our life as a community. Prayer is our union with God throughout our day. So the question becomes, well, how do we get there? How do we get back to that place in those times? In fact, thinking back to last week uh, in our, converse, uh, our coffee and conversation, we asked, the, we asked one another, think of a time when your life seemed to be so alive, to that place in your life that you wish to return to and extend. And people spoke about those places of beautiful union in their life. Some spoke about their wedding day when they gave themselves in love to another. Another spoke of her home at Christmas and filled with children and grandchildren well after they've all gone to bed breathing as one holy family. How do we get back to those places of such joy and union in our life where God seems to be simply the air that we breathe and the life that we live? Well, now I would say that prayer as an act is an irreplaceable gift. It is hard to find our ways to our way to that place of union with God and our neighbor without stopping on occasion to pray. Why? Well, in prayer, in this time that we've carved out here, this hour every Sunday morning, we come to pray. We come to stop. And first and perhaps foremost, to contemplate the very dream and life of God. We come around this table of the, uh, 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 of, of, at Eucharist. We come around this table and we hear again God's dream and promise for the world. We get to contemplate and to, that is to consider again quietly God's dream for ourselves. For you, for your life, your home, our community. That quiet, just in this hour that we share together, allows us to see ever more clearly God's dream for us, for one another, and the world. It gives us a vision into the world we can live. It does something else, however. As we come together in this place and we see, we see not only God's vision, but we also see God's act. In prayer, as we stop, we begin to see God all around. Mother Marine used a phrase last Sunday uh, in that conversation that we begin to see that we live in a God-drenched world. That place of contemplation allows us to see that God is working all around us. Through all of the acts of kindness, all of the acts of mercy, all of the acts of grace that fill the world day to day. Yeah, we're seeing some of those acts 
Um, we're seeing some of the acts of brokenness play out before us on TV today in horrible display. Of course, I'm talking about the war in Ukraine. But woven into that story, our story is story upon story upon story of grace and care. I mean, one of the, the simple, beautiful stories that, uh, that we see, uh, that we've seen these past weeks, uh, are the stories of, of mothers to mothers leaving strollers and supplies and clothes at train stations for strangers. A mother's heart reaching out to a strange mother's heart out of simple care and love. This is a story of God's grace surrounding us. Prayer allows us the time and the intentional time to see God's story in our lives. A story that we so quickly and so easily walk by and take no notice of, but for that moment of prayer each day. Prayer allows us that quiet, contemplative space to see God's dream and to see, to see God's dream and God's work in the world today. Prayer allows us another thing as well. It's where we began this morning's service. You'll recall the, that long litany of penitence. Prayer Confession, in a, in, a, in a more technical word. Prayer allows us the space to consider to the gap that exists in our world and in our lives. It shines a light on the reality that God's dream and God's work is not all that there is in my life. It allows me the chance, it allows us the chance to bless and give thanks for the interwovenness of God's story. And it gives us the chance to confess and repent, shall we say grieve, the brokenness that exists alongside of us. Prayer is that space, that time that allows us the opportunity to contemplate God's story and ours side by side, but for a moment or two in the day. You'll notice that prayer in such a frame is different from meditation. It is, a di it is different from a quiet walk. That is to say that prayer as a tool is an intentional contemplation of God's story and our lives each day. So now, I've overwhelmed you. I said, how is, I can imagine that there is one out there who is saying, well, how do I do that? How does one enter into that place once a week, let alone once a day? I can't give myself to an hour every day, Father Drew. To this discipline. I hear you. And so as we venture into Lent together, I want to invite you to two, sim to two things. First and foremost, the intentionality to gather for prayer together. If nothing else, to, in to commit yourself to this time to this time and this space and this community to pray with one another, to contemplate together the mystery of God's dream and God's work. If you have but an hour, let it be here. If you say, now I got that hour in my schedule, I'm good, I'll be here. What more? I want to invite you to, one, uh, to a second step. A second step that will take five 
no more than 10 minutes a day, split up into two blocks. So one of the great things about, um, about COVID being over, prayer books are back in our pews. And so I, I want to invite you all to look at your shins, because right in front of you, at about, on the pew, under the pew in front of you, is a prayer book, a black book with a cross on the cover, a book that hasn't been dusted off in a long, long time. <laughs> Let's dust it off for a moment. If you have a prayer book at home, fantastic. You don't need one. Um, if you don't have a prayer book at home, fantastic, because you have one in your hands, and it can go home with you. It doesn't have to come back. We'd love to have it back, but it doesn't have to come back. I'd much rather see it used. Page 137. The whole book is a book of prayer, but on these four pages, 137, 38, 39, and 40, maybe 40, one, two, three, four, four, yeah, is a small little section on daily prayer, broken down to its most fundamental, and I pray accessible. You'll notice that the first one is, it's, it, these are daily devotions for individuals. They're one page. They take literally about two or three minutes, if that to say. What you'll find is that you pause a little longer as you say them. And my invitation to you is simply this. Before you pick up your phone in the morning, I know that's hard. Before you pick up your phone in the morning, before you turn on the news, before you turn on public radio, give yourself three minutes. Three minutes to say the daily office or the daily devotion for the morning. Start your day with the simple intentionality of God. Drawing God to your mind, drawing God's vision to your heart, and One of the beautiful things that William Temple says, um, William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury, 1940s, he says, you know, it is the duty of every Christian to forget God during the day. Yes, when you are at work, when you're cooking, making breakfast for your kids, when you're immersed in work um, or teaching at school or whatever, driving your car, you should be fully present to that work. Not off in la-la land with God. And so what he says is, in order for that to happen, in order for your day to be entwined with, enmeshed with God, yet forgetting God, one must have times where one is intentional about God. And so begin your day with a moment, just a few minutes, of God. So there's three to five minutes, I've asked. And then I invite you to end your day in the same way. Whenever you go to bed, when you put down your phone, put it down. And take up page 140 or page 141, daily devotions at the end of the day. Go to bed with God on your heart and mind. Three to five minutes of reflection upon God's presence in your day for which you might give thanks. We speak 
of the gap in our lives. Prayer is an invaluable tool in closing that gap. You'll notice that prayer is not fundamentally about you. But I suggest that it will fundamentally change your life for the good. As you become more aware of God's work in your life, and even more joyfully, perhaps, your hand in the work of God's life. For together, we, the people of God, make God's dream a reality. We do it together with God and with one another, and prayer will help us along the way. Amen.